Amen. Hallelujah. It may be seated. You know, I just I so love it. You know, we got guys standing over here worshiping God. Man, I'm just telling you, that just thrills me. And I to see, I'm thrilled when everybody goes for God, but to see men going after God, we're saying, you know what? We're going for God. Amen. We are gonna we're gonna go for God. We're gonna allow Him. And your example impacts other people. Yes. Amen. It absolutely does. That first one. Then the others are like, okay, we can do this. Amen. And now somebody's pushing me out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'll give it back to you here in a second. Um, <laughs> hey, I've got a lot of announcements today, so I'm going to breeze through this. So I want to make you guys aware that we are doing, uh, there will be a prayer lot parking prayer time on August 13th. If you want any details on that, please see Laura Wall. Raise your hand, Laura, so everybody knows who you are. That's Laura. Um, I guess you could call her. I guess her number's on there, but uh, you can see her. But it's going to be just be a time of prayer in the parking lot and just to, just to come together and just to intercede for our nation and stuff. So also just want to let you know, this is a really cool thing that we're getting involved in as a church this year. It's called Inspire Our Schools. Um, Every school, they're asking like people to go pray over each school, and so we chose Lovejoy because we've been supporting them for years, and so we're, me and my wife are going to be out there leading that, and we're just going to pray over the school, and you're going to, we're going to pray for every, over the doors, and it's just a really cool experience of just interceding, and I was talking to the lady, she was like, this is Holy Spirit inspired. And so it's like they want God to be. And so we're just coming together. So if anybody wants to join me on August 15th at 7 p.m. at the front doors of Lovejoy, I'll be praying and leading a prayer uh, for a little bit. But just asking God just to intervene into the schools. So also just want to make you aware, we love kids around here if you haven't noticed. And uh, we are doing a school supply drive because we believe in the future of our children. And so if you haven't already given some school supplies, do ahead and go. If you have... We thank you. We really do thank you for that because that goes a long ways to helping some of these kids be able to get what they need for the year. Also, if you're like, hey, I can do something else. I can pray every day. There are prayer cards on the welcome desk over here. You can grab one, fill it out, hand it to me or give it to uh, Betty. And we will just we'll sign you a kid and we'll just have you be praying. If you're like, hey, I want to be signed a kid. I, I don't know who that kid is. You can come and see me or Pastor, or Pastor Mallory and we will just show you who the kid is and... Uh, we just want our students to be covered in prayer because when they walk into the schools, I'm telling you, what they walk into is demonic. Yes, and what God wants right. to do is bring life. And I believe Amen. that our students can bring life and Holy Spirit into those schools as we pray for them every day. Also, I'm really excited that Young Adults is coming back. Our hiatus from the summer, that also makes me sad because that means summer is over. Um, but we are starting Young Adults back on August 20th on Friday, and we're going to be meeting in the fellowship hall. We're going to get that going every month again, and uh, just getting into the Word and learning more about ourselves and God and what He has for us. Also, whew, my last announcement, Pastor can start moving this way a little bit. Um, we are doing a back-to-school Sunday, and we will in two weeks we will have a family service, which means you get to hear from Pastor in the longest. And Pastor Mallory, and then I'm crunched in the middle, which means, hey, you get what you get with me. But uh, we're going we're gonna to just have a fun time of just seeing the kids worship and being a part of what God's going to do for the next beginning of the school year. There you go. Should I just stay up here? There you go. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hard to find good help. That's the thing. <laughs> Actually, it'd be Pastor Mallory, then Pastor Drew, and then me. So we always tell, so Pastor Mallory, we always tell her you got ten minutes, and she goes like fifteen or so. So Pastor Drew and I just understand we fill in the gaps, and uh, we got a theme this year: all in, all in. And uh, so uh, that's what it needs to be in our faith and our walk with God: all in. You know, it's not just a put your toe in. But uh, to be all in. So John chapter 3. John chapter 3. But before we go there. Um, how many of you think that there is a sermon in bingo? <laughs> you wouldn't think so, would you? Well, you know, Friday night we had a wedding rehearsal. And then we went to Gladtimers. I love Gladtimers. Skip does a great job. It's awesome. It was Barbecue chicken. I had to take four napkins. 
And so then, and then they always have some social activity uh, at the end. And so uh, I know some of you think how, how we have slipped down. We're playing bingo at Gladtimers now. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Skip and Rusty's sister, who they like to tease and call their mother, Martha, was there. You'll have to let her know she's in the sermon. And so Martha was there, and she was sitting, and, and so we started to go to bingo, and she said, I'm leaving because I never win. Oh. <laughs> and besides that, she had to go take her cats, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, I never win. I'm a loser. Oh, no. She might not have said exactly like that, but, you know, I have to paraphrase. I'm a loser. And I'm like, no, no, stay. You know, it's fun. You'll have fun, you know, and... Uh, I, so I convinced her to say, got her a card. You know, I, but I thought how often Satan does that very thing to us. We have failed to win a whole lot in our life. We would not classify ourselves as a winner. In fact, we would be more likely to classify ourselves as a loser because we don't feel like We've had a lot of wins. And uh, I just said, no, 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 stay, stay, stay. I said, and here's, the, here's that special card. And so uh, she stayed. She's like, okay, fine, I'll stay one. You put enough pressure on people. <laughs> Did I mention how good that barbecue chicken was? Yeah. Did I mention that? Man, that was good. And uh, so next, the next one's in uh, September, the first Friday in September. We'll have to announce it again because you guys won't remember, will you? We played that first game in, and Marsha's calling out the numbers and who wins? Martha. Martha wins. She goes, ah! I said, you're a winner! I said, this is, there's a sermon in this. I didn't tell her I was going to use it this week. <laughs> Just hang in there. Don't quit. Don't quit. It's, that's, it's like a double negative. Um, keep trying. Don't stop. Amen. I was going to say, don't stop trying. <laughs> don't quit. Don't give up. Because God has a plan for you. He has hope and a future. Jeremiah, he's got a plan for your life. <laughs> he's got important things for you to do and lives to touch and minister to. So don't Listen to the lies of Satan that you are a loser. You are not a loser. I feel like we, some of you don't believe that, so let's, let's say this together. I am a winner. Let's try it again. You guys are, I, I feel like you're losers. I mean, joking. Wow, you're so, so sensitive. I am a winner. Yes, because, well, John chapter 3, we're going to find out that you are a winner. That you are a winner. So, John chapter 3, we're working through this, and how many of you have watched any of The Chosen? Yeah, so, there's, the Nicodemus is kind of a factor in The Chosen thing. And it's interesting how they portray him and stuff as the religious leader. And uh, I feel like it, it fleshes him out a little more than what we just get here. But uh, John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. So that would mean he is pretty high up. He's a person of authority and leadership and a religious person. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come to you this morning. We ask that you would lead us and guide us as your word comes alive in our hearts. Yes. Thank you, Lord. In your name, amen. amen. I want to start with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a spiritual, he was a religious person. He had been trained in religion, he had been trained in faith, but he also had moved up into a power. He was a, a leader, he was all those things. And yet, as he watched Jesus, as he 
saw the miracles, as he paid attention. So, and this is the thing, this is the thing that makes my heart rejoice, is that as he saw all these things, the Holy Spirit was moving in him. Yeah. See, there were a lot of other Pharisees. There were a lot of other religious people who saw what Jesus was doing, who saw the same things that he saw, but they hardened their hearts and fought against Jesus. They hardened their hearts. There was no, but, but I believe that. Nicodemus had a hunger. He had a hunger. You know, as I, this past week, as I've been out in different places, and I see people all doing their things and living their lives, and it was like God spoke to me and said, they're not hungry. It just seemed like what I saw evidence in their life, they have no hunger for spiritual things. They have no hunger for the things of God. They're so busy with everything and consumed by everything and they're focused on everything, but a hunger for the things of God. And so Nicodemus, even though he was a, he was a church person, he was a leader in the church, he was a big wig, he still said, God, show me. I want, a, I want more of you. I want to know you more. <laughs> See, Jesus, to some degree, was coming against some of the stuff that, that they held important. Last week, we, we saw how he made a whip it, and he chased out the money changers, and he, and he was taking authority, and he was, you know, and he was following after John the Baptist, who called him a bunch of uh, vipers and, uh, and terrible people. So we find Nicodemus, and he, and he wanted to know more about Jesus because he saw the miraculous signs. He said, there's something supernatural, and he said, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God. He said, I believe you are from God because of the supernatural things that you do. God is the God of the supernatural. Jesus was doing supernatural things. He was speaking life. He was doing all those things. Healing the, the blind and the deaf and the, I mean, and, and we haven't seen all those things yet, but there was enough happening that Nicodemus said, wow, wow, I want to know. But, how many of you would like to protect your, you know, when you're in leadership, you want to be careful because they had, with the rabbis back then, they had the cancel culture. And that if you put your faith in Jesus, you were going to get kicked out. Remember the man that was born blind from birth? And when they went to his parents and they said to the parents, is this your son? And they said, uh, yes, he is our son. And yes, he was born blind. But we don't want to touch anything else. We're not willing to testify. We weren't willing to share because um, they knew that if you put your faith in Jesus, you're going to be kicked out of the synagogue. Out of the temple, you weren't gonna your 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 environment was gonna change. It was going to cost you something to follow Jesus, and so Nicodemus understood that. And so it says that he came to him at nighttime. <laughs> he was trying to figure it out, kind of on the side. You know what? However you come to Jesus, he's still going to speak truth and life to you. Yes, amen. How many of you are glad that Nicodemus took that step yes. and went to see Jesus, whether it was that night or whenever it was? He came to Jesus. 
He came to Jesus and, and the, the pillar, the post, the, the foundation, in fact, the initial uh, output that Jesus is going to put is found in John chapter 3. This is a huge theological, it was a huge transformation that's about to happen in this conversation. You're like, whoa, what did you just say? So Jesus says, so uh, Nicodemus approaches him with that saying, you're a man of God. I don't know what he was expecting, but Jesus, and here's the thing, Jesus always knows the right thing to say. And Jesus says it in such a way that it leads you to a new revelation. Nicodemus was willing to have a new revelation. He just wasn't, he wasn't sure. And so he said, Verily I tell you, no one, no one, you might want to just uh, highlight that in your Bible, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. No one can see that. No one can be a part of the kingdom of God. No one gets to go to heaven unless they are born to, born again. That's the claim that Jesus made right there. You know, and it's interesting because there for a long time you talked about Christians, and then the term "born again" became a kind of a catchphrase for people who uh, who are following Jesus. They say, are, "Are you born again?" And uh, so it's interesting because he says, you got to be born again to Nicodemus. Poor Nicodemus. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, you know, I'm guessing he's, he was probably my age. You know, you, you know, and your thought process only works in a certain way. <laughs> Figured I'd get an amen or two out of that. <laughs> wow. And uh, so Jesus says, you have to be born again. Well, Nicodemus only understood one kind of birth. That's where mothers go through a lot of pain. And uh, this baby comes out. And uh, I'm always surprised when people have that second child. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> after the first one. And they're like, no, I ain't doing that again. <laughs> Not only was it painful, but now they're keeping me awake all night. Right. Every two hours they wake me up and they, ah. Oh. Nicodemus said, and, and we kind of feel like, duh, but think about it. If he had said this to you, so how can someone be born again when they are old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. He's like, uh, I don't get it. I don't get it. And by his question, though, it opened up to Jesus sharing incredible deep truth. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised by saying you must be born again. See, he keeps saying that you must be born again. This is Jesus saying this. This is not Paul or somebody else. This is Jesus saying this is the way to heaven. There are a lot of people who want to say a lot of things or point to a lot of other different verses or different stuff. But what did Jesus say? Because he is the final authority. You must be born again. So he said, it says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or, or where it's going. So it is with, with everyone born of the Spirit. So as we look at that part, flesh, uh, unless they've been born of the water and the Spirit, and theologically there's some thoughts on that uh, as far as being born of the water, uh, some would say that was uh, if I can find the right spot here uh, that was physical birth water breaks baby comes out all that stuff so that's above my pay grade <laughs> <laughs> 
the physical birth. The physical birth. And then others uh, have said that uh, perhaps he was, re re he was uh, pointing back to the book of Ezekiel chapter 36 where he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So some people would say, born of the water would perhaps be being choosing to follow him and being baptized in water. You know, because Jesus said, repent and be baptized. Right. And that was a water baptism. And then there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit comes to live in and through you in a supernatural way. So, you know what? We need all of those. You had to be born of a mother. But we need a spiritual washing and cleansing and regeneration. And I find it interesting that Ezekiel, in a sense, was prophetically declaring what Jesus would do. He was saying, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone. Because, you know, before we met and walked with Jesus, we had a heart of stone. The, the other Pharisees chose to have a heart of stone. They how do you get a heart of stone? And how do you know when you have a heart of stone? Here's how you get a heart of stone. When God speaks to you, you refuse to obey. When God speaks to you and asks you to do something and you say no, it begins to get hard. There's a little hardening that takes place. And then he speaks to you and he and he says to do ask you to do something else. And you say no. The more no's you say to God, the harder your heart gets. The harder your heart gets. And at a certain point, it's as if you can't hear the voice of God because you've hardened your heart. You have chosen to reject the words and the truth of God. And you have become hard toward him, but not only do you become hard, but you become critical. Yes. And a critical spirit will keep you from receiving ministry. Yeah. Folks, you might not agree with everything I do or leadership or somebody else, but when you begin to have a critical spirit, you begin to criticize because the Bible says if you got an issue, you just go talk to somebody. You just go have a chat with them and walk through that. But when you begin to have a critical spirit, it cuts off their ability to minister to you. You have put up walls and barriers. And you can't receive from them. So, to on a regular basis say, God, check my heart. Yes. Check my heart. Is my heart becoming hard. You know, and, and one of the check things that you can do is worship. When your heart gets hard, you stop worshiping. You start critiquing instead of worshiping. I remember, remember one time we were in Canada, we'd gone up there fishing, we went to a church. And they had dancers and flag and stuff. They had the, the, the whole kind of, the whole troop of ladies that would go up during worship and had banners waving and they were dancing and they were doing their stuff. We didn't really come from that tradition. And my son was there and he's like 12. And he's like, dad, dad. <laughs> I'm like, sometimes son, you just have to close your eyes and worship. Because, you know, they were, those ladies, those people were worshiping, but for Dan and I, it was a distraction. 
They were like, oh, she's out of step. No. <laughs> I know, ever the critic. <laughs> you know, so you say, you know what? I'm going to worship God. And some of you have said, I'm moving to the front because people in front of me are a distraction. I'm going to get in the front so that I am not distracted, so that I can worship God. Because that's where your heart needs to be, to have that. So Ezekiel, I will sprinkle clean water on you. You will be clean. I will cleanse you from your impurities. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. Oh, Heavenly Father, do that in our lives. Do that in my life. A new heart. I'm just saying, as a pastor, sometimes you can get a, your heart can get hard. You're dealing with people and problems and, and people <clears throat> don't always get it right. And people disappoint you sometimes, and you're like, ah. But you know what? God is faithful. Yes, he is. He is faithful. And to say, God, make me new. You know, I, I feel that. Do any of you still have sponges? Mm -hmm. You know what a sponge is? <laughs> you, you smile, but I'm just saying. There's a lot of people, I don't think they even have. I don't know if you here don't have a sponge in your house. Only one. I guess sponges are more popular than I thought. <laughs> when you stick that sponge underneath the sink and let it sit there for about a week, how is it? Yeah, hard. Hard. It is absolutely dry and hard. Right? Yeah. And how do you... Is, it, is the sponge like that any good to you? No. No. no it's absolutely worthless. Until... You put water on it. Are you getting a, a comparison here? Yeah. That when we allow ourselves to get hard, we're like that sponge. We are useless to God and to the world around us. And God says, I want to pour out my spirit on you so that you can be refreshed and renewed and a new person, a new creation. That's what the Bible talks about. So, born of the flesh, and then born of water and of the spirit. Born of, born of. Catch those words, born of. How many of you were able to make yourself be born? I know it seems silly, doesn't it? But think about that. None of you had really any impact on you being born, right? That's right. Well, maybe. You whined and cried and came early or late or whatever. You did all those kind of things. Born of. Born of the Spirit. See, I think... We, in our natural state, think, I am going to, because we wash ourselves, correct? You can wash and you can clean yourself up, but you can't give birth to yourself. That's not how it works. You can't have that birth, and, and, and Jesus is talking to me here about, you have to be born of the flesh, but born of the spirit. That is a supernatural event. You see where I'm going here? That is a supernatural event that has to be God-inspired. Yes. Your spiritual birth. Until we have a hunger and a thirst. And, and there has to be a, a spiritual birth event that takes place. That's beyond information or all this other stuff. There has to be a, a supernatural event that takes place in your life. A birthing. Before you get to be a part of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. You must be born again. You must be born again. How can this be? Nicodemus was from Missouri. <laughs> I will never ever be able to pastor or minister in Missouri, will I? <laughs> They will bring these tapes up every time. Actually, they're not tapes anymore, are they? They're whatever. 
Facebook things. How could this be? And Jesus, Jesus is so awesome. He kind of thumps him on the head. He's like, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? And I'm like, duh, you got all the scriptures, you got all the stuff. Why can't you understand this? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but you, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? He said, I am sharing the things that I have seen and that I know, and still you don't believe. I believe that Jesus was a little frustrated because he's sharing and he's pouring out stuff and they're not getting it. Yeah. And they, or they're choosing not to believe. They're choosing not to believe. See, folks, and Jesus is saying, I'm sharing earthly things with you and if you can't believe those, how are you going to believe earthly, heavenly things? How am I going to be able to share those things? Are there certain people that you believe more than others? Yeah. Absolutely. So, is there anybody in your life that if they shared something that was outside of the realm of your understanding, perhaps, you would say, okay, I'm going to believe that. Because you trust them and you value them and you believe they're a person that you feel like is truthful. But you know, there are going to be times and things where people are going to share stuff with you uh, that you're going to have a hard time comprehending. You know, for somebody who has perhaps lived in Costa Rica all their life, and I from Iowa come down there and I say, you know what? In January, all of the water in, in all of our ponds freezes, and you can walk on it, and you can drive trucks on it, and you can drill holes and fish through it, and you put little huts on it. They would say, never been to Iowa, never been in the winter, they lived in the Costa Rica. Does the water ever freeze there? No. No. How many of you would like to go there? Yeah. Yeah. And I say, but the things freeze. And they would say, it's never happened in my experience. <laughs> right? So will you believe things that are outside of your experience? Or do you have to have seen? My father said his grandfather, I can't remember one of those, had a saying. Experience is the best teacher, and a fool can learn no other. Yeah. Folks, if you can only, if you're only going to believe what you have seen, and you're not going to trust other people, your life is going to be very limited. You, you have to figure out who is honest, who is trustworthy, and believe them. When we're dealing with spiritual matters, Jesus or spiritual leaders share stuff with you and you say, you know, I don't understand that. There's a whole lot in the word. I don't understand. I'm like Nicodemus. I would have been asking dumb questions, I'm afraid. But Jesus shares. And uh, not only that, but it leads him into it leads him into great revelation. He says, verse 13, no one has ever gotten into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man, referring to himself. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Everyone must be born again. Everyone must be born again. Everyone who puts their faith in the Son will have eternal life. You know, and you, you go back to, somebody said they, said they were in, in Numbers. Numbers 21, it says, 
They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way, and they spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Wah, wah, wah. There's no bread. There's no jelly. There's no peanut butter. We detest this miserable food. Eh. Man, I feel like they were like children. I guess they refer to them as children. How many of your kids are like, dude, I don't want that. Oh, we ate that last week. Blah, blah. <laughs> Even God gets irritated. They were moaning and groaning. And uh, it says, Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. Then the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. You know, it's interesting because many times there was just prayer and then stuff happened. But in this particular instance, Moses prayed for the people and God said, I want you to make a bronze snake. And I want to put up on, on a pole. And any So you got this pole up there and he makes this bronze snake, which is odd odd that God would because he was saying don't make graven images, don't make idols don't make all these things and later on we find that uh, they destroyed the snake because they were offering sacrifices to it so much so many times we, we get our eyes off of the Jesus and we put our eyes on stuff so the Lord said make a snake put it on a pole, anyone who is bitten can look on it and live so Moses made a bronze snake, put it on a pole then anyone who was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. John 12, 32 says, And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. It, it's amazing how prophetic God was in the Old Testament. It's like he knew what was coming. Supernaturally. He said, and Jesus referred to that. And so, a, he's referring back to that prophetic moment, but he's also looking ahead to the prophetic moment when he was going to put, be put on the cross. Mm -hmm. And that everyone who looks to him will be saved. Yes. So, going back to the Israelites, they're getting bit. How many of you like snakes? I know Pat Atwood's right. She, she left. I just talked about snakes and she left. <laughs> so, I'm just saying, when that Kyle Joe's guy was here, and he, and he had that snake. She was gone. She was just out the door. Not a fan of snakes. So the snakes were biting them and they were dying. And he put this bronze serpent up there and said, if you'll look on that, you'll be healed. Do you think there were people that got bit by a snake that failed to look at it? Yes. Possibly. However, when we're dying and desperate, we'll try anything. Mm -hmm. And after one person looked at the snake and they got or looked at the, that bronze snake and got better, then the word went around. It really works. It really works. When you when you look at that, when you do what God asked you to do, He brings healing. Hallelujah. When you do, and so one did it. And then the next, and then the next. When we look on Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith, we are given new life. Those people who were bit by the snakes were destined to die. Their life was about to end in the wilderness. They had no hope. Folks, is that not us before we meet Jesus? Before we look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith? When we put our faith in him, then... Salvation comes and we are set free and new life. We're given a new life. Hallelujah. The poison of the world and sin is washed away. Yes. Amen. He is the antidote for sin that destroys everything. Let's bow our heads this morning. The words of Jesus just keep echoing. You must be born again. You must be born again. Verse 15, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. 
Everyone who puts their faith in Jesus can have eternal life. So first of all, this morning, have you heard the words of Jesus? Have you put your faith in Jesus? Have you looked on him who was the author and finisher of our faith? Have you asked him to come into your heart to forgive your sins? Paul said, everyone who believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth shall be saved. You're on your way to heaven when you take those steps. Those people in the desert simply had to look on that snake. They didn't have to do any special extra other things. Just look on the snake. Put their, put their faith in what Moses told them to do. And be obedient. This morning... For you to ask Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. To say, Jesus, I want you to be the center of my life. I want to put my faith in you and serve you with all my heart and soul and mind. If that's you this morning, I just invite you to slip up your hand. Say, Pastor, that's me. That's me. I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want to do what you asked me to do. I want to trust you. Heavenly Father, Jesus, he wants to forgive you. He died on the cross so that your sins could be forgiven. It says that he regarded our helpless estate give us life. He's calling out and he's reaching out to you and he's saying, I love you. I love you. I love you right where you're at. I want you to be my child. I want to forgive your sins. I want to give you new life. If that's you, just slip up your hand. That's me. I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want to trust Him. I want to walk with Him every day. Maybe you slipped up in your hand, maybe you didn't, but. Worship and in the Word, 
will bring you back to life. Back to life. So this morning, as we get ready to close, for you to say, God, I need you to pour your Holy Spirit and your presence into me. I feel like maybe my heart is getting hard. I feel like I need a fresh touch. I don't care who you are, we all need a fresh touch. We need a daily touch from God to give us life, to keep us from getting a hard heart. Let's stand this morning. find it interesting that there's all the prayer initiatives that are going on right now. We're going to have prayer in the parking lot. We've got prayer at the schools. We're praying for our kids. God's putting that in people's hearts. That tells me, you know, some of you weren't here at the start of the service. I shared that last night I could see the lightning and hear the thunder, but I was not in the storm. I could see it. But I wasn't in it. But because I could see the lightning and hear the thunder, I knew the storm was coming. And I feel like the perhaps in your life there could be a storm coming, but as a nation and as a world, I feel like there's a storm coming. Yes. There's a storm coming for those of us we're believers and that we need to be prepared and what's prayer about being prepared as we spend time in prayer and in worship God changes our heart he softens our heart he prepares us so that we can hear his voice in that time of crisis and we can have already made up our mind before they ask you the question. The early believers had already made up their mind when they say, deny him and live or stand for him and die. Long before the question was asked, they had already made up their mind. I'm going for Jesus. They don't even, they didn't have to stop and think about it, didn't have to weigh their options. They simply said, no, I'm with Jesus. I am with Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning. We thank you that you know the storms that are coming and that you're preparing us. Lord, I pray for each one who's here this morning. Lord, that you would soften our hearts, that we would become tender toward you and toward your word, toward your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would free us to worship you with all of our heart and soul and mind. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you love us. Jesus, thank you that we can be born again, that we can put our faith in you and know that we have eternal life. Jesus, we love you.